So if you remembered one thing from calculus class, if you took it, it was probably the power rule. So there's the power rule right there. So if you only remembered one thing, it was probably this. So we're going to go and prove this now. So proof, we're going to use, of course, definition of derivative. So f prime of x equals lim h approaches 0, fx plus h minus fx divided by h. I'm going to do a change of variable. So we got x. This usually is x plus h. And the difference between the two is h. So that's normally how we think of x some other x value, we just call it x plus h. All I'm going to do is rename that z right there. So what is h equal? h is z minus x. What happens when h goes to 0? So when h goes 0, z minus x goes to 0. z minus x. Now if x isn't changing, what does that mean is happening to z? z is approaching what number? Not necessarily. So you subtract two numbers and you get a small quantity that's getting smaller and smaller. Lead of infinity. Would it be approaching x? Yeah, so their numbers are getting close together. So you're subtracting them and getting a small value, so that means the two numbers are getting close together. And you can see that right here, x plus h, we want that to go basically closer to x. So that means z <coughs> is approaching x. So we're going to change our limit around. Instead of h's, we're going to have uh, we're going to make this substitution. So this becomes lim z approaches x. And z is just x plus h. Yeah, that's what it was before. We're just relabeling it, basically. So I just made some substitutions and I had to change my, what my limit uh, value and variable are. So now we're going to find this limit. All right, what function are we using? We're using somewhere f of x is x to the n. So I'm trying to find f prime of x. I told you what it is, but now we're going to have to actually show that it is what I told you it was. So f of z, that's really easy. That's z to the n minus f of x is x to the n over z minus x. Oh, what is that equal to? Yeah, the only other thing I wrote on the board that was significant, which is this algebra right here at the top. So we're going to make that substitute said they're equal. You believe me on Wednesday, so we're going to make that substitution for the equal thing right there. <coughs> oh, what happens if I plug in? What happens if I just uh, let z approach x? So wherever I see z's, I put x in. What do I get? Zero over zero. And zero over zero usually means you need to work a lot harder using algebra. So not necessarily undefined, you have to work harder. So I did all the hard work for us. So all that crazy algebra we took care of on Wednesday. So now we're just going to write in. We're starting with uh, z to the n minus 1 plus xz to the n minus 2 plus dot, 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 plus 
x to the n minus 2z plus x to the n minus 1. Are we divided by 0 anymore? Not divided by anything anymore. So I can go ahead and wherever I see z's, I'm going to plug in x's. So wherever I see z's, I'm going to plug in x's. So what is x times x to the n minus 2? Yep, x to the n minus 1. So we're adding one more x, one more power in there. Now what would have come next right here? It would have been an x squared times x to the n minus 3. So add those two together, those powers, and you get x to the n minus 1, etc., etc., plus x n minus 1. Yep. Oh. Minus 2. No, I had that right. So we're combining those two together. That's x to the n minus 1 plus another x to the n minus 1. All right, easy algebra. Combine like terms. They're all the same. The question is how many terms are up here? So we have to count that very carefully. How many terms? So we'll analyze this pattern the best we can. We have to do it, I think, on this uh, top line right here. How many x's are in the first term, if I write them out? x to what power? Zero. Zero. So we got no x's in the first term. And then I have my biggest term is x to the n minus 1. So we have to count like computer scientists. Normally, we start counting at 1. So we, normally, we would count, oh, there's the first term. So there's n minus 1 terms that I just underlined. So from 1 to n minus 1, there's n minus 1 terms. But there's also a term out here. So there's actually n terms total. So the squiggle, under the, uh, the squiggle line, there's n minus 1 terms looking at the pattern. And then there's one more over here. So there's going to be n of them total. And that is our derivative right there. And we started out up here with f prime of x, which we could, of course, write as d dx of x to the n. So that's a derivative of the x to the n function. All right, that's our power rule right there. So we call that the power rule. The algebra I just showed you only works for positive integers n. Unfortunately, I can't prove it to you for other numbers n until you get to calc 2. In calc 2, I'll prove it to you for any values of n that aren't. Oh, it works for any values of n. So for now, you'll just have to take my word that it works for all the other values of n that are not positive integers. And at some point in the future, I'll show you why. All right, so there's a power rule. This is for any. I only proved it for integers, but this is really for any real number n. I will not ask you to prove that on your quiz or midterm. Don't worry. I'm showing you where everything comes from. I'm trying to tell you the complete story of calculus. These rules are not just made up out of nowhere. We have a definition, and everything comes out of the definition very carefully. All right, constant multiple rule is the next one. Oh, we'll do an example. You like examples. Oh, I should write down when. You have to be a little bit careful. So this is some small print. When x to the n, x to the n minus 1 are defined. What do I have to be careful with if I have uh, 1 half power? So I'm doing square roots, so what do I need to be careful with? What, what type of x values? X can't be negative. The x can't be negative right here. 
So if I have some fractional powers, I have to make sure I'm not going to have a ma uh, complex or imaginary numbers coming out of there. So other than that, it'll, uh, it will work. So that's what I mean when x to the n is not defined. So for example, square root negative 1, not defined, at least not in the real numbers. So we're going to keep it real in calc class, so you don't have to worry about um, complex analysis. All right, constant multiple rule. That's up next. So d dx or d over dx, however you want to pronounce it, I'll usually just say d dx, and that's what I mean, d over dx, that symbol. That's what we call an operator. So what it does, it operates on what's to the right of it. You've used operators before. They're called functions. So I want to talk about operators for a minute before we get into this rule. So normally operators operate on the expression to their right. So if you have f of x plus 2, that means the function f is going to operate on the quantity x plus 2. And that is not the same as f of x with a plus 2 afterwards. So f operates on what's to the right of it. So if your parentheses end, that's where the operator stops operating. So whatever the plus or the multiplication outside of that, it doesn't operate on that anymore. So you want to be careful with your parentheses. That's why I went in and dropped some parentheses to show the ddx operator operates on c times the function, not just the number c. So operators operate on expression to their right. There, is, there are a few operators operating on the expression to their left, like the factorial operates on what's to the left, but we're not going to worry about that. Uh, for a while, so all of our operators operate on what's to the right. And that's why I use some extra parentheses here. Alright, we're going for a proof right here. So we're going to suppose so suppose this exists. So we have a differentiable function or else we can't really start taking derivatives. So if we have a differentiable function, we're going to uh, figure out what in the world is d dx of c times f of x. The only thing I know about the derivative is the definition right now. So I'm going to use the definition limit h approaches 0. It's a little bit strange here what our function is. g of x is c times our original function f of x. So this is limit h approaches 0, gx plus h minus gx over h. So what is g of x plus h? How do I write that? Wherever I see x, I just put x plus h in this place. So it's not very much going on. It's just going to be c times f of x plus h like that. So where I see x, I'm going to put x plus h in there. Uh, C, you're multiplying the output of the function by the number C. If you're a graph person, it's a vertical stretching by C, basically. Uh, but both, you know, G of x plus h and G of x both get multiplied by C on the outside. That's why I just wrote the G of x and G of x plus h uh, next to them. 
All right, what can I do with C? Factor it out. There's a C times, another C times. We're going to factor that out. What limit law can I use right here? So this is the multiplication limit law. So limit of a number times some expression. Conjugate? No, although that's not bad instincts. Um, we do have, you could multiply by that plus itself, uh, you know, over. But we're not gonna do that right here. We're going to write, this is the limit, limit h approaches zero of c times lim h approaches zero All right, what is the limit of C as H approaches zero? zero. C. C. It's always a number C, no matter what H is. It's a constant, it's like the constant limit law. What about that second part, the product on the right side? What's another name for that? You've only seen it 20 times by now? It's a derivative, definition of the derivative. So that's, there's a few ways to write it. You could write it as f prime of x. That's one way to write it. Another way to write it is d dx of f of x. So there's a few different ways to write it. And what do we start with? We started with d dx of c times f of x. So constant multiple of a function, if you take the derivative, it's the constant multiple times the derivative. So a derivative doesn't really care if you multiply by a constant. So there's a constant multiple rule right there. And that's the end of that proof right there. Some rule is even easier to show. Whoa. Now remember the derivative operates on what's to the right of it. So if I look at, on the left side, the ddx operates on everything above that squiggly line. If I go look at the right side, the first ddx operates on f of x, and the second ddx operates on g of x. So they operate on what's to the right of them. So as soon as you see the plus or any other math operation, you're not taking the derivative of that. It's just what's to the right of it. So that's why I have to use the parentheses around fx plus gx. When I want to take the derivative of the whole thing, I need extra parentheses to show that I'm taking a derivative of that whole quantity. It's like kind of, um, you don't necessarily want to think about it like multiplication is an operator. Uh, multiplying is an operation. So in some sense, an example of an operator is multiplication, uh, but that's a very specific example. All right, some rule. And we can start on either side, it doesn't matter. We're gonna go with the proof now. Let's start on the left side. So we're gonna suppose f and g are diffable. So that means their difference quotients will be nice values. You know that the limits won't be crazy, they'll exist. So we're gonna start here. The only thing I really know to begin with is the definition of derivative. So I don't, I don't know that it splits apart yet. So we got lim, h approaches zero. Now, what we get, we have to replace the x's by x plus h. 
So there's the first part. That's the function of x plus h minus the regular function of x. divide by h. So that's the original function of x plus h minus the original function divided by h. Now, our goal is to have two different derivatives, a derivative of f plus derivative of g. So I'm going to need two different lim h approaches 0, one of them that has all the f's, one of them that has all the g's. How do I split this apart? Let's put all the f's first, all the g's second, so we get them in the right order. So I have an f of x plus h minus the other f of x. So I got the two f's first, then I'll do the g's second. So any algebra questions there? So I have minus, whoa, that was a problem. So that, yeah, because my original was f plus g. So I distribute the negative sign, I get minus f and the minus g. Now I'm going to take this big fraction and break it into two fractions, add it together. Now the limit is also an operator, so it would be bad form to leave it like this. It's a limit of the whole expression added together. So I need to really go and write that extra parentheses. So you know I'm taking the limit of both pieces, not just the limit of the first one. Now we're going to use it. That was all algebra. That was like algebra 2 stuff right there. So now we're going to go and split the limit across the sum. So this is the limit law where the limit of two things added together is the limit of each one, as long as they're not undefined or infinity or negative infinity. So we're going to split the limit up. What is this first limit here? Limit h approaches 0 of fx plus h minus fx over h. F prime. That's f prime, or derivative of f, however we want to write it. That's just f prime of x. What is the second limit? g prime. So we could write this as d dx f of x plus d dx g of x. And where do we start? We said that was, we started with d dx of f x plus g of x. So hopefully that's what we started with. There we go. That is what we started with. So we're using all of our limit laws to go through and show the derivative rules. after I finish writing this one down, we'll do the quiz. All right, so I'm going to get a little lazy with notation. Instead of writing the of x, of x all over the place, I'm just going to write f minus g. Derivative of f minus g, the proof is not different at all from the sum rule. It looks like this, derivative of f minus derivative of g. So there really is no subtraction, there's only adding negatives. So it's the exact same proof, there's just a negative sign hanging out instead of a positive sign. So we'll do the product rule. I just want to warn you, it's not going to be what you think. 